for the talk. We've got Simon up next, um, and the talk is born to, an, born to an Illuminati family, mother worked for um, MI5, grandfather, British diplomat, Freemason, and member of MI6. Simon will take you on a journey exposing workings and values of such family, families and connections to hostile beings. So guys, big round of applause for Simon Park. Thank you. Hello everybody. First of all, thank you very much indeed for inviting me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, thanks Dave, Dave Hodrin. Um, Dave Hodrin and I know each other. He was one of the first guys to look into my case. And Andrew Johnson, uh, you know, I won't unfortunately be able to stay for your talk tonight, but it's nice to be here and know two of the speakers so well. Um, before I start, I just wanted to pick up on some of the points. I was busily making notes while uh, Dave Hodrin was speaking. Um, and just wanted to, to quickly put through. We talk about the lion beings. Um, Stuart Swerdlow, um, who did suffer from uh, a number of uh, projects with a guy called Dr. Green, better known as Dr. Mengele, and I think one of the audience mentioned that. Um, he actually seen the lion beings, and Stuart's flying over from Iceland to see me later on in the air to, to discuss that, so that would be really good. Um, uh, I wanted to talk about disclosure. There have been big points on that, um, and Dave Hodgson is absolutely right the countries of the world, in my view, are waiting for America to make the lead. Now, the Prime Minister of Russia, a guy called Medvedev, um, a few months ago tried to push the agenda, and that was very interesting. Um, just very briefly, I, I would agree that some of the greys are humans from the future. Somebody made that point there. Um, we talked about Roger Lear removing uh, implants. Um, Robbie Williams, a very famous uh, music star, has actually met with Robbie Lear in a hotel room and been shown an implant. And Robbie Williams is very interested in, in ufology. Um, I've had an implant which is removed. I've got a scar on my hand and had another one put back in again. Um, yes, I might talk about mantids and reptilians. Um, I might talk about um, a few other bits and pieces. But the conference today, I thought, was more about uh, being free. Humans actually trying to break free of the elite that control us all. So I didn't want to make this a, a, an alien UFO talk. Uh, I do plenty of those. If you saw the Channel 4 documentary, um, gives you a chance to meet me then, doesn't it? Not just what was on the television. Uh, it wasn't as it was meant to be. Uh, I particularly feel sorry for the two women. Um, Dave Hodgson has, has worked with at least one of them. Um, and in their words to me, they were set up. What you don't know is that I spent about an hour and a half talking about MI5, MI6, which the director of Channel 4 said was very keen to have on, and then got a phone call from Channel 4 saying no, nope, they were going to take it out because they feared that the documentary would be pulled. What you also saw was me overtaking uh, a line of cars because we were being followed by an Audi, and the impression is that that was a reconstruction. No, it wasn't. Um, we had a one hour and 20 minute interview by an RAF radar base, it's actually an American radar base called Filingdales, it's a space radar base, we were right on the edge of MOD land, we had what we call the, uh, uh, the radar, radar array radar. behind me, <laughs> and um, that the director thought was a very good backdrop, uh, three days before the documentary went live, so I don't know how they managed to pull it, I had a phone call to my house from Filingdales, uh, from the base security, telling me they were very unhappy that I was doing a documentary, and I said, and I said to them, Am I in the right position? Yeah, there. <laughs> I've been told to stand here, but you should have put some lines here so I could work with it. Um, and I've told they were very unhappy that I was doing a documentary um, and who was filming it, etc., etc. I said, It's got nothing to do with you. We weren't on MOD land. Um, however, I've been told that the Ministry of Defence contacted Channel 4 and told them to remove all images of the radar array. So you immediately have a documentary that had nothing to do with MI5, MI6, which is supposed to contain a lot of it, nothing to do with the radar array, nothing to do with filing those. And people are even doubting I went there, so I've actually brought something for you to see to show that I did actually go there. And also, I would think I spent about 45 minutes to an hour talking about reptilians, and I was told that the reptilians were not going to be entered, but I could talk about any other entity I wanted, but not the reptilians. So, so that's what they did to me, uh, in terms of the, the other two women, who I both know, um, they attempted to make them absolute fools. And I will tell you, I know them both, and they are very serious and they're very genuine people. Okay, right, well, let's, let's crack on now. 
So my talk today really uh, is about the Illuminati, because I think that fits in very well with the agenda of uh, right. So I think they made it a big joke, although they, they sold it to us as a very serious attempt to discuss the matter. And I understand that um, it's going to Cairn, and they're going to attempt to get a BAFTA award for it. They think it was that good. However, the, the backdrop from that is um, other, other news agencies do ask questions, and they don't have that uh, evil agenda. Um, and I'm on TV on Tuesday, the morning programme, and also CNN want to interview me and put it around the American circuit. So what I can do, hopefully, is try and pull it back a bit. Um, so we've discussed what was taken out. That's the Filingdales, that's the radar uh, base station. Um, I was invited around here by an ex-member of the security service. Uh, you don't just turn up and put your name on a list. You have to be invited. Uh, it's goes down as RAF Filingdales is actually run by the National Reconnaissance Office, the NRO, who report to the NSA, the National Security Agency of America. And it's the only three-phase radar in the world. In other words, it basically looks around the whole of the Earth. Um, officially, it looks up to about 5,000 miles in space. Uh, I would believe it goes up to around about 26,000 miles in space. Uh, it's officially a, a, a ballistic missile warning device. Uh, I think it does rather a lot more than that. Um, I have friends in the security service and they arranged for me to go around there. Uh, I'm going to do Men With Hills, it will be the next one I go and visit. Everyone was very polite, everyone was very helpful. So there we've got Men With Hills on the right. Uh, one is a listening base, um, covertly listening to information, and the other one is actively searching space. Um, we have this guy, Edward Snowden, who went public whistleblower. Uh, he was talking about um, what we in the UFO industry have known for 20 years, that the NSA and MI5 share information. So Britain eavesdrops on America, America eavesdrops on Britain, and so our laws are not broken. So it's illegal, of course, in Britain to listen to any communication or write any, look at any email unless you have a court order. But it's not illegal for an American Secret Service to look at your emails, listen to you, uh, and then pass that on to Britain. And so this guy had, had the guts to come out and tell the truth, so we'll wait and see if they hang him. PRISM is the name of that project, one of the, one of the projects that they actually do. Um, I show this enough times, I show it because it's really important. Can somebody tell me what the building is, please? Anybody? Good, thank you. But, but you're cheating, because you've seen it. Um, this is the NSA's headquarters. Um, and where's that? GCHQ. So they're both working together to spy on each other's country. It's perfectly legal. Uh, it's immoral, but it's perfectly legal. Anybody know what those are? Okay, Edward Snowden was trying to blow the whistle on this. This, this is uh, Bluffdale, and he will be the largest facility for holding information anywhere in the world. It's in America. Um, and it's run by, will be run by the NSA, who wish to store every email, every phone call, every digital piece of information, whether you empty the wheelie bins uh, in the Midlands or whether you live in Iceland. Now, the question that Ed Snowden's asking is why on earth would somebody want to have all that information? But this is what's being built, and Obama signed this into law back end of last year. Okay, part one the Illuminati and insight. Uh, it is actually a way of thinking, a way of acting, and a way of ruling. When I ask people who or what are the Illuminati, what sort of response do I get? Who are the Illuminati? Pardon? Shout out. Families, yeah. Can you name some of them? Rothschilds. Rothschilds. J.P. Morgan. Great. What, we've just had this big festival down. Yeah, and what was it called? <coughs> Okay, the Bilderberger, yeah, good. Okay, what I want to try and do is get away from the fact that when we talk about Illuminati, we talk about bankers, we talk about uh, big politicians. I want you to try and think of it as a club, a group of people who aspire to the same principle and then go out to see where the power is. So if it is in the banking, they want to put their best person in there. If it's in the pharmaceutical company, they want to put their best person in there. If it's in the political second, they want to put their person in there. So I want you to actually start thinking, instead of individuals, thinking of as a, a club, 
uh, a secret sect that has been signed up to and agreed in blood. <coughs> You're all familiar with this. This is the uh, Eye of Horus on top of a pyramid, and I'm sure you've seen the one dollar bill. If you haven't, when we have a break, I've got one, and then we'll play Find the Owl. So I'll give you a, 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 a glass, and if you can have a look, you can spot the owl in there. There's also a little reptilian hidden in there, and it'll be fun to see if you can find it. So it's announcing the conception of the New World Order, 1776. This is old, 1995, but it's probably one of the best representations of the Illuminati. Uh, nowadays you see them designed as grids and um, graphs, and this is much better. Let's see if we can make this pointer work. Oh, good. So on the left-hand side, this is what's considered the traditional Illuminati. And here we have a magical Illuminati, non-satanic. Here we have the military, the knights, um, but moving into public office. And on the right-hand side, very much the military side, that's the Templars. And here on the right-hand side, we have the satanic orders. Um, and let's just get away from this view that white is good and black is bad, because here is the great white brotherhood, and you can have pure evil. So this gives you a fairly clear representation of um, how the Illuminati works. It is a group of um, different organizations who join together and work for the same goal, but each have a different form of rules um, and uh, organization within it. Uh, earlier this year, I had an invitation to join. Um, you will be surprised, as I was surprised, that I had an application form. Uh, and my question was, why would a secret society have an application form? And they said, well, in your case, we think it's very important that we know what we're saying and you know what you're saying. I don't leave, let this form out of my sight. I've brought it with me today. If during the break you wish to have a look at this, I'm more than happy to let you look at it. I won't allow any photographs of it. Uh, I'm going to read just one front part of it. It's called The Order of the Hidden Masters. It was given to me by a very prominent politician. It was posted to me, and then this politician turned up uh, about four days afterwards to ask me whether I would accept. i just read the first part. Uh, the Order of the Hidden Masters... The Order of the Hidden Masters consists of a group of teachers and students who do not reveal their identities as members to the general public, to their friends, or even amongst themselves. They work entirely in secret and may only mention the order to those whom they know to be worthy in every way in the manner explained hereafter. The only person who knows all the teachers and students is the Supreme Grand Master, and he in turn is only known to those who serve on the Supreme Inner Council. The ramifications of the order are worldwide, but none of the leaders have ever been discovered by the uninitiated anywhere. So, the question is, why? was I invited to join the non-satanic arm of the Illuminati. I wouldn't accept the satanic arm because I'm diametrically opposed to that, uh, and I didn't accept this one either. Okay, so what I want to do is just to um, talk to you a little bit about my life growing up within such a family, and we'll, we'll talk about what they are. Um, my grandfather, uh, who, his name was James Owen Marsland, he was a British diplomat, uh, you all know it as MI6, he called it the Secret Intelligence Service, the SIS. Uh, he received the OBE, the MBE, the CBE, he was offered a knighthood to be one of the Templars and turned that down. And one of his views was the public can't even go to the toilet without our help. Okay? And then he said, the politician, this is during speeches at dinner that he would give, the politician is only concerned with the next election the diplomat with the next generation. By their nature, the politician is beholden to the public and must inform them, but the public must never know. They are incapable of making the right decisions. We do that for them. So the point here is that a group of people are already putting themselves above the vast electorate. Right, very quickly, um, my grandfather went off to India in 1932. Uh, he um, was working in a cotton mill and there was a, a rebellion to try and throw the British out of India. He took some heroic action, which we're not going to go into now, and as a result of that he was awarded the OBE and what we in the family call the appointment. 
The appointment is his joining what we would call MI6. But in those days it wasn't called MI6. I think it was only called MI6 in the late 1930s. So we always referred to it as the appointment because we would never discuss it. Um, those of you who have perhaps seen any of my other talks, um, my grandfather was instrumental in removing the then king. Uh, the king who was having an affair with Wallace Simpson. Uh, the story is that uh, the church and the government could not um, uh, allow this because she was a divorcee and therefore the king sort of abdicated. Well, that's not what my grandfather told me. Grandfather told me that uh, Wallace Simpson was having an affair with a guy called Von Ribbentrop who was a Nazi, he was actually in the uh, British, well, the German embassy in London. And although Wallace Simpson wasn't an active spy for the Nazis, she was passing documents across to him from the king. Believe it or not, it was um, the, the CID, um, that actually, or the special branch, that actually spotted this, went to the then prime minister and said, this is, you can't have this, the king's got to go. The prime minister couldn't come to a decision, so he went to his friends in the Illuminati and said, what do I do? So the Illuminati said, if you're not big enough to make the decision, form a jury. Twelve men. Uh, we will nominate those men and they will vote on whether the king stays or goes. Then you can go back to the king and say the country has no confidence in you. My grandfather was one of the twelve. He was based in India and he said in those days you had to be very careful because all information came from telegrams and they could break codes very easy. Remember, this is long before Enigma was, was, was up and running. So he had a telegram which basically said in code, should the king stay or go? And I asked my grandfather, what did you vote? And grandfather said, I voted that the king should go. And I said, what was the vote? What was the score? And he said, 10 voted for the king to go, two to stay. So the prime minister then went back to the king and said, your country has no confidence in you. I understand that the King said I want to go on BBC Radio, World Service, and tell everybody, Home Service, what's happened. And he was told, no, the BBC have orders to lock the doors to keep you out. Um, you, can't, you can't be King. Um, and my grandfather, um, being a very materialistic man, because he was very much part of the Illuminati, uh, was always upset because anybody who took part in the vote was given a token of this great momentous act that they'd been involved in. And he was given a coin, which is from British West Africa, uh, one of the few coins that was struck bearing Edward VIII logo, but not the head of the king. Grandfather said to me, had he been based in Europe, he would have received either a penny, or what we have then in those days, a threepenny piece. And I think they go for a quarter of a million pounds now. And he was always really miffed that because where he was based, he didn't get a British coin. He got, and I brought that coin for you today to have a look at. He gave that to me. Um, it was just a token. Uh, in your, when you are in the Illuminati, you, you tend to believe very much in tokens, whether they are uh, colours, signs, or numbers, or magical symbols. Uh, he returned to Britain. Um, he worked to persuade the United States of America to join the war against Hitler. It was a very big campaign to get the Americans to come into the war because they were on their isolationist policy and he took a lead in that. War was declared on the 3rd of September. On the day war was declared, my grandfather was offered, do you want to have an officer, be a serve in the army, or do you want to do this commission and be in a diplomatic post? Uh, grandfather accepted the post of vice consul. Uh, he was at the British Embassy in Pondicherry in India. And the amazing thing is, it didn't take him long to get him out. He was told, we can't afford a straight bomb to kill you, we're going to get you out now. He was put on an ordinary passenger boat with a destroyer as an escort, and he left uh, just less than a week after war was declared. Uh, when he got there, he decided that he wanted his wife and children to be sent to India, so yep, another destroyer was sent, and this time the, the family was brought out to him. He was given a, a understrength, I understand, an understrength platoon of Gurkha bodyguards, and this caused a lot of aggro, and because the Gurkhas were there to protect him, <laughs> not the British ambassador, nor the, the property of the ambassador, but to protect my grandfather. And then in a short time, my grandfather was promoted to British consul. Uh, after the war, India gained independence, and my grandfather was posted to other countries. Uh, he particularly spent a lot of time in America and France, um, which explained why he never said trousers, but pants. He would have a lot of Americanisms because he associated an awful lot which, which would become the American CIA. 
He also met Stalin in 1947. That was particularly to talk about Roswell. At that time, the Americans were not sharing any information with the British, and my grandfather was dispatched to Stalin because it was felt Stalin had infiltrated the CIA uh, or the American intelligence um, and would have the info. Stalin's <coughs> reply to my grandfather was, give me 10 years and I will have infiltrated the CIA. And grandfather did not come back with any information. And then he was awarded the MBE. He returned to the United Kingdom and was awarded the commander of the British Empire, the CBE, which he was very proud of because it was the British Empire. Uh, he then had a falling out with the British Prime Minister. I think that was Clement Attlee, but grandfather was very, very tight-lipped on this. Uh, he offered and accepted a post as British, uh, Britain's representative to the United Nations. So grandfather was out there doing trade deals. Um, but this was really a cover, so he could still have a diplomatic passport, move all over the world. He retired from diplomatic life in 1961, but he remained an active member of the SIS, MI6, where he met JFK just before he retired. And then he went on to retire in 1965. He declined a knighthood, but he accepted a companion. Became a companion. It's interesting. Um, when he left, he was offered stocks and shares in Rolls-Royce. So his gift to keep quiet was, what do you want? He said, shares. Rolls-Royce, not the, not the motor car, the engine. He knew a big, big deal was due with McDonnell Douglas, the American aircraft company. Um, and the deal was that they had to have uh, British engines in the American aircraft. Otherwise, the British government felt it couldn't accept it. These were going to be Rolls-Royce engines. And my grandfather, inside the dealing, knew about that. I want shares in those. Uh, he also went to Mapping the Webs, which is one of the premier jeweler shops on Regent Street, and was allowed to walk around the store after hours and choose whichever silverware he wanted. He was told that there'd be no record of him showing British government involvement, and for that reason, he did not get a civil servant pension. He didn't even get an ordinary state pension because they wanted no records, and that's why he got the stocks and shares. He was meant to live on those. So no pension for him because they did not want him. And we have got some records. So I've got the coin if you want to have a look at it. Uh, Edward VIII, King of India and the motherland. This was the alliance that never was, 1937. Here is the then deposed king um, being uh, greeted by Hitler. And that is Wallace Simpson. And this says it all. So you've got that Adolf Hitler treating him as if he was the king. And for those of you, it's not part of my talk, but we'll just quickly say, for those of you who ever wondered why Rudolf Hess made that strange flight to Scotland, this was all linked in it. The landed families were on the point of doing a deal, and you do have to thank Winston Churchill for preventing a takeover. Uh, Winston Churchill would not fall in with the plan. Um, this is a photo shot from a computer screen showing... My grandfather, I got this from the records office, having been told nothing existed of him. Uh, and if we do that, you look, occupation, vice consul. So thank goodness I've got some proof to show not only existed, but he was uh, a diplomat. He was a vice consul. So I'm really pleased to have that. Uh, CBE, this is the medal that he really, really was proud of because it was for the empire. My grandfather, very much part of the empire. He declined the knighthood was going to be St. Michael and St. George. He even went for a fitting. Um, and the reason that he was happy with this one at first was because there you have the archangel treading over Satan. So it was death to Satan. However, he didn't like when he found out, let's have a quick look at that, that in Latin, around the medal, it says a token of a better age, which was then explained to him as a new world order. So he decided he wasn't going to have any of that. I'll talk about my mother now. Um, she worked for the British Security Service. Verbally, you say SS or Security Service, but because of Adolf Hitler's SS, you don't actually write SS. So you would always say British Security Service. It's only, only the uninitiated that use MI5, MI6. Um, my, my mother, um, one of her statements would be, the public can't be told. Look at Orson Welles and his H.G. Wells adaption. Um, my mother um, knew Orson Welles very well, and she uh, told me that in the late 30s he'd done an adaption uh, for an H.G. Wells story, and it absolutely panicked America. What she said was that was planned to see how the public would cope 
with uh, stories of uh, aliens landing if it were real. The result was absolute pandemonium and it's to this day has set a lot of American mindset so we can't afford to tell the public. Um, and my mother also would say, if we're not there to hold their hands, what would the great unwashed do? I.e. what would the ordinary members of the public do? And another of her saying for the public was they're all just children. So who is really calling the shots here? Um, my mother being a British subject worked for, let's just call it MI5, um, but she was told that in actual fact she was working for the National Security Agency of America, but because she was a British subject, she had to be managed by MI5. My mother's job was to type out documents relating to crashed UFO craft, and she did this from the late 1960s until her death in 1979. So perhaps we'll just talk a little bit about the documents. Uh, a guy would turn up, and he, his name was Paul Dunlop. That's not his real name. He had three uh, sports cars. He had his private, private aeroplane. And he actually quite openly said, I took my name from a tyre. So you can imagine him with his sports cars looking at the tyres. I'll call myself Paul Dunlop. I've no, I'm no problem in using these names. And my, my mother worked for a patent office called GF Redfern, which were based in Brighton at the time. And uh, she was told that if she worked for this organisation on the left-hand side, uh, as a single parent, she would get two wages. She would go down at 3.30 every Friday to where she used to work, go into reception, sign her name, she'd get a brown envelope, which would be her wage packet. But she didn't need to go and work there. And then once a month, this guy would turn up and pay her money on a monthly basis. And as he said to her, as I didn't call it single parents in those days, he said, as a mum on your own, having two wages would be really helpful, wouldn't it? So my mother signed the Secrets Act. She didn't even know what she was signing. Uh, and then she was told that you have been cleared to an extremely high level. If you ever discuss this or anything that we talk about, you will be found on a railway line, and then who will look after your son? And with that, the guy walked out, and that, that was done. So her job was to receive documents which were all in German, uh, came from what was then the West German Republic, um, there was no swastika on the lead. I often get asked that. There's no swastika, just a big German eagle on the front. And on the top of the paper, in red ink, it either said secret, top secret, very top secret, or in purple ink, extremely top secret. And Paul Dunlop would hand this document over. He would take out a small pocket knife. He would cut the ribbon. There were two very big uh, seals either end of this document. He would cut the ribbon. He'd sign his initial on the top right-hand corner, give it to my mother. She would then sign her initial. It was her document. If anything happened now, it was her responsibility. These documents were only between seven and, I don't know, 14 pages. There were blueprints with them. Um, nothing like you used to on, with modern technology. These were huge pieces of paper, and you got blue ink on your hands when, when you opened them, and all the lines, the schematic drawings were in white. And then there were other documents in there which were as thin as an onion skin, um, and they were all in German. And these documents all followed the same line. This is what we've got. This is what we've found. This is what we think we can do with it. And then at the bottom section was whether it could realistically be used in a battle situation. So one of the first ones she ever had was how to um, communicate with a submarine under the ice. And this was interesting because she took me to see a film with, um, with my, one of my favourite actors in there, a guy called Patrick McGoohan, and it was Ice Station Zebra. And I think in Ice Station Zebra, the submarine has to come up through the ice to put its uh, aerial up to communicate. My mother was laughing because she knew they'd already invented a system that allowed a satellite to beam down through the ice without it being uh, diffracted or reflected off the ice so the submarine did not have to break cover. Um, and a lot of these uh, uh, documents were saying, you can't do this or you can't do that, but we can do this with it. Uh, for an example would be a nuclear reactor. They had, in 1969, a nuclear reactor the size of a VW car. And Paul Dunlop took his green pen out, put a line through it and said, well, the Americans won't know what a VW car is, but they'll know what a Mini is. So he was not only checking the, uh, the translation, but putting it in a, a system in a way that the Americans could understand. Because these documents... Um, when they were finished off typing, were taken down by my mother in a green Jaguar that collected her to Brighton Station, where she met a gentleman in a bowler hat, red carnation, umbrella, 
copy of the Financial Times, they would sit together on, on the London Brown platform, uh, pass some very, very weird code words between each other, swap newspapers, and he would walk off with the document inside the, the Times. And that's what she did from the late 60s to 1979. Now, mon Mondays to Fridays I was at school and I couldn't see any of that, but on the weekends when my mother worked, at lunchtime she would just close the document and go into the kitchen and have her food. And I had about 45 minutes to an hour and I would always at the weekends if I was at home go up and read what she typed to read the translation. So for many years I was reading these documents. Um, but just to put, put the truth on this, um, because people say, well, why would they have a young child so un, un, um, unaccessed, really? And, and all I can say is that on the times when Paul Dunlop and other gentlemen turned up and were discussing stuff, I was never asked to leave the room. And in fact, in Paul Dunlop's case, he was an ex-RAF fighter pilot. Uh, when mum would go out and make the coffee, he would actually pull chairs out and we would play, chase the UFO. He would sit and be the, the pilot and I would be the co-pilot, and he would like be telling me to turn left, turn right, or jinx left, as he used to say, and fire missiles. And when my mother would come in, instead of jumping up and being embarrassed, he'd carry on with the game, and then stand up. And often, uh, if I was like cleaning out my goldfish, or playing with my, my soldiers, or my scale electrics, or whatever it was, and they would talk about something, and I would look round, and he would look at me and smile at me. So now looking back on it, for some reason, they had no intention of excluding me from their conversations. Why didn't I join the security service? I've got my um, grandfather in MI6, my mother in MI5. That's the reason. That's a very good reason. Uh, although, interestingly enough, my, my daughter has just emailed me yesterday. She's meeting an Under Secretary of Defence in uh, Belfast. So maybe it's coming back through the lines. But that's principally why I don't, I cannot be given access to anything because of these creatures. Have you seen the birthday card? Anybody been to any of my presentations, seen the birthday card? Right, well while I talk I'm going to let you hand it round and I'll tell you the story of it. Um, inside is a photograph of me taken at the same time, just in case you're not sure. Uh, about a year and a half, two years ago now, I was in the local, local store, it just opened. Where I live in Whitby, um, only 12,000 people, and when a new shop opens, everybody goes to the new shop. And this is called the Card Factory. And I went down for discounted uh, Christmas wrapping, and I was in there, and I turned to the left, and in a carousel was this card. And I couldn't understand why my photograph was on a birthday card. I had no recollection of this, no memory of this whatsoever. So I, I just, absolute days, I took it to the shop, paid for it, and sat at home for two hours. And I thought, this, this, this can't go on. So I went to see my solicitor at York, Yorkshire Law, um, and he said, well, there's only about three people in the country that can handle this. It's intellectual copyright. Um, because it's England, you've got a better chance of contacting these individuals yourself. So I contacted the managing director of Card Factory, very helpful gentleman, came back within 20 minutes and said, well, we haven't broken the law. We've bought this image from a company called Paperhouse. Here's the phone number for the managing director of Paperhouse. So I went to Paperhouse, very helpful managing director, spoke to me straight away. Um, said, yep, we bought this image from another company. So I thought, well, this is going to chase the ace, really. But the company that I um, got through to, Photo Library, based in Seattle in America. So I went to, uh, on the email, because there's seven hours difference, and very unhelpful. I managed to find some posters of me when I was standing as a Labour candidate in Hackney in London about the same time to prove who I was. And I said, look, I know the shirt, I know the tie, I know the glasses, I'll tell you the date of that, it's about 1997. And the guy on the other end said to me, ah, it's close enough, it's 1996, so we have to take you seriously now. Um, this went on for about two to three weeks, and in the end I got an email back from them saying we're not going to do anything about it. I could phone them, so I phoned about five o'clock in the afternoon my time, and the result was basically, well, your laws in England don't touch us end of story. So I said, well, um, you're telling me that's not me in, in the motor car then? And his exact words to me were, oh no, Mr. Parks, I'm not saying that's not you in the car, but that's not the name of the person I've been given. And that was as far as it went. I was so absolutely cross with this that I thought, I'm going to go to the press 
Not because I want the publicity, but I want the press to get phoning them and give them a hard time. And the uh, editor of the local newspaper basically came back to me and said, uh, we've been pressuring them and all they're going to do is say no comment. Um, he said to me, do you want it to go national? And I said, no, because there's security service implication in this. Anyway, uh, I went back to the card factory and said, look, uh, the very least you could have done from a 3D world perspective is you could have paid me royalties for this. So how many cards have you made? So he said, uh, I can't remember, six or seven, but he said, let's say he said seven, seven cards. And I said to him, seven cards? You've only made seven cards? He said, yes, it was a test run. We wanted to see how well they sold. I said, how can you possibly know how well it would sell if you've just done seven? And I said to him, anyway, I've bought seven. To which he said, you've bought our entire stock. <laughs> so I said, okay, you did seven cards with my picture on it, and which stores, because they've got something like 120 odd stores, which stores did you send it to? Your store. So you did seven cards with my picture on it, and to test it out, see how it would sell, and you just sent them to my store where I live. And he said, yes. And he then said, it's a small world, Mr. Parks, and I really must go. And that's the end of it. So that card's coming around. Please have a look at that. And you can see it's genuine. It's got the price ticket on the back of it. Um, you know, if you had your time again, I wish when I was in that shop, I'd looked over my left-hand shoulder. Because I bet you I'd have seen a guy in a fedora hat, a white shirt, a black tie, and black suit, putting those cards right behind me. This is the thing with the security service. They could have posted them to me. They could have put them through the letterbox. They could have left them on the doormat. But oh no, it's this theatrical game. They can afford to do it. They have millions and millions of pounds siphoned off from taxpayers' money, which is never declared. And this is part of their fun. This is probably the bit they enjoy doing. So there's a bit of evidence for you. Oh, the, the vehicle's been identified as a, a, um, a white Rolls Royce. And it's uh, not in America, it's definitely Britain, because in the picture's a tree, and we've identified that as a North European tree. If I had an expert on construction, you could look at the, f the uh, flyover road behind it, and I bet you an expert could even tell us what part of a motorway that might be. But I never got that far. Okay, this is about freedom, it's about humanity waking up. Um, this is the Hadron Collider. Um, we're all told about the, the bose higgs and particle. We're told that we're looking for dark matter. Um, and the guy on the right, anybody know the guy on the right? Okay, we're, we're told that 2012 never happened. Uh, it's my view, 2012 did happen. But unfortunately, so many people were waiting for the earth to shake, for bright lights in the sky, and when none of that happened, people felt nothing had happened. This guy's name, it, it roughly translated as Akhtar. Um, and he, I was actually on uh, Bill Owen's site, Bill Owen from, from Project Camelot. Um, and I'd been banging on about the Hadron Collider that it was a very negative device. And somebody emailed or put the story up on Bill Ryan's site. Um, basically, it's Project Avalon. Basically saying, do you know what? There's somebody else saying what you're saying, Simon. And she sent me a clip to this guy. And this guy was warning, although I had been warning since November of last year, and he had decided that this device was very, very negative, and he was traveling around South America with these devices that he was making, cost about $1,000, um, which he was implanting in sacred sites in South America to try to negate this device. That's a, a shot of the Hadron Collider. Um, it's very much like you fire a laser beam down that. As that's the beam. Um, it had, in my view, had a two, two, twofold purpose. One was as a weapon, uh, a huge device to generate an energy particle weapon, but also designed to affect uh, energetic levels as we reached 2012. So you're going to want, all right, Simon, how do we know about it? Um, it was very important to me that this device failed we could not allow this device to work. And if you look there, we've got the dates that it was supposed to work. This device was supposed to operate just over the period, surprisingly, coincidentally, that the peak of energy was going to happen at the end of December. And if you look, it says shut down, no beam. The device failed to operate. 
at the crucial moment. It's no surprise to me that it failed to operate. But what I will tell you, within two days of that failing to operate, there are now talks of building a new one. They wanted to build one with a diameter the size of London. They couldn't do it in the time. They got till 2016. 2016, jumping ahead here, 2016 is when the energetic levels will change and there's no way back for these creatures. So 2016 is the last date. The only thing they can do is enlarge the device that they've got. And that's the plan now. If you go on Google, you go look at it, they want to enlarge this device. Billions it's costing, but they're only admitting to a proportion, a fraction of that. And I suppose what I would say to you is that we live in a world of money. Nobody does anything without money. So where's the big banker behind this? Because they wouldn't pay three, four billion unless they would say, where's my return? You'd be very surprised to know that there's no individual, there's no corporation behind this, put the money up. Governments have paid for this. And you might not be surprised to know that America has lent on a number of its friends and said, you're going to pay for this. And a number of its friends have paid for this device. So I don't, I don't buy the, the Boson Hickson particle. Um, I don't buy any of that. This was a weapon, but it was also a device to alter 2012. And that's why it didn't work. Um, what, what factory or what scientific institute would have scientists working right up to 23rd of December? These scientists come from all over the world. Many of them have families. This device was going to work right over to Christmas Day and Boxing Day. But as you can see from the picture that I've got from the screenshot, it shut down. It didn't work. Okay, let's move on. Um, what I'm imagining, I totally agree with, with um, Dave Hodron. Um, nobody wants to empower, wants to give disclosure um, because they would completely lose the control they have. One of the worries I have is a false flag uh, announcement, an alien invasion. Uh, what I'm looking for is lockdown on the internet, travel, uh, and then it will be told that this alien invasion has been defeated, and then you'll find discovery of human clones. And then you'll be told there's a second invasion coming, we can't deal with it on our own, we need a one world government, because only by linking all our resources together can we defeat this so-called alien invasion, which doesn't exist, okay? But because of these human clones, we can't tell who's human and who's alien. So we're going to have to chip you. It's the only way. And then we'll have these uh, checkpoints. And then you go through and you're scanned. And if you've got a chip in you, we know you're human. And you can go on and buy your bread and your milk. Radio frequency identification. This is the chip that you're probably very familiar with. It's a chip the size of a rice grain. And for heaven's sake, we do it with our cats and dogs, don't we? We, we chip them so if they get lost, they can get found. You might not realise, but when you go into a shop and you have the tags, it's exactly the same technology on your clothes or your food. It sets the beeping off when you go outside of a supermarket and you have uh, forgotten to pay for it. However, this is the problem. Those are grains of sugar. That is a chip. It can be injected into you. And this is modern technology. This is the way it is. And that little black dot, not the white one, but the black dot is the chip. Okay, so that's an RFID chip which would contain enough information to identify you. The, the issue I have with being chipped is quite simply that um, it will have your bank details. And if you uh, went to a demonstration in London and you were very vocal um, and uh, you, you dis disagreed with the government, all they've got to do is turn your bank account off. They don't need thousands of soldiers and policemen. They don't have to do this agenda of killing off 60-70% of the population, that's old hat now, the Illuminati aren't into that, because they can control you all by chipping you. Uh, you may not know, but the co-op supermarket um, is this year going live with the scan, uh, with the mobile phones. It's trialled out in London and New York. Um, you go to the shop, you place your mobile phone where you normally put your debit card, and that scans a, uh, a chip that's inside, uh, or an application, and it will automatically access your bank account and pay for it. This is a direct uh, plan by the Illuminati to do this. You're going to have to look at me very carefully. You know how we all walk around? If you're left-handed, your phone's in your left hand, and if you're right-handed, your phone's in your right hand. We all do it, and I do it. We walk everywhere. So you're going into the co-op, or wherever supermarket, or whatever it is, and you put your phone down on the reader. 
After about two years of that, they'll say, why are we doing that? We could chip your hand. You're so used to doing this, we're just going to put it in your hand. So now you just go in and you just put your hand down and it will read the chip. And already uh, the, the, the promo is for the Marty Lopeny Garage Door. You can put your chip up in America and Lopeny Garage Door. And there are official adverts running on America saying, and I'm not going to do the American accent, you have your, your, your typical white middle class uh, family saying, I'm so scared of terrorists that if anything happens to my children, they're chipped, the authorities will be able to find them. This is a real serious campaign and you must resist the chip. Do not take the chip because you won't be humans anymore. Okay, let's quickly move on now to Satanism. Satanism is the driving force of the masters. The Illuminati are um, run and led by masters. That's the, the terminology. Uh, it's not the masters that are getting caught, you know. It's everybody underneath who are getting caught. And the press are passing off Satanism as paedophilia. All right, I'm not going to upset you with anything, nothing you don't already know. So they never get caught. And they just disappear into the background just like that did. And you are given a completely different picture to what's going on. Very quickly, the Express ran an email, I beg your pardon, an internet newspaper, which was quickly taken down. This was not what appeared in the newsprint. I'm just going to go up front and read it. Jimmy Savile beat and raped a 12-year-old girl during a secret satanic ritual. We're not hearing this word satanic anymore. Satanic ritual in a hospital. Um, he also chanted, Hail Satan, in Latin, as he did his dastardly deed. So, paedophilia, Satanism. This is one of the houses that Jimmy Savile lived in. I got this picture sent to me by someone who's very helpful to me, just before the police turned up to chase him away. Let's look at the graffiti that somebody had scribbled on his house. Oh, look, there's a triangle and an eye on it. So somebody knew that we were dealing with a satanic Illuminati agent and not just a one-off paedophile. So who's a victim and who's abuser? There's a Prime Minister Ted Heath, as he was, with Jimmy Savile. Jimmy, um, Ted Heath, uh, my, my mother had a very clear view, uh, and my five had a very cl clear view of Ted Heath and what went on on Morning Cloud, which was his boat. Not going to go into that in public. And here we've got Jimmy Savile and Di and Charles. You may not be aware, but the Queen actually asked Jimmy Savile to intercede when the marriage between Charles and Diana was breaking up. Why would Her Majesty the Queen ask a Radio 1 disc jockey and host of Top of the Pops to intervene at the highest level to try and save a marriage? This is Lord Louis Mountbatten in his glorious days with his medals. Lord Louis Mountbatten, of course, was blown up by the IRA um, somewhere just off the coast of Ireland on his boat. And in private, I might talk to you about that. This is Lord Louis Mountbatten in the middle. He's got his hand on Charles's shoulder. I always wonder who Charles's father really was. Okay, let's look at the royalty in the church. This is a screenshot, several screenshots from BBC News. This is Jimmy Savile's funeral. My daughter was attending this funeral. Um, <clears throat> and you've got Members of the Masonic Order there. Why are members of the Masonic Order there, the guys with the white? Why are members of the Masonic Order at Jimmy Savile's funeral? What's the point of that? Why is the church rubbing shoulders with the Masons? This is a card which says, Wishing you a very happy Christmas, New Year, with best wishes. And it's uh, Charlie and Camilla. And this is to Jimmy Savile. Okay? That's a birthday card, a Christmas card to those two from Jimmy Savile. You won't see this anywhere else. This is the Queen and a nurse. Now, if you ever know, at the King Edward VII Hospital, um, what will generally happen is that the royal family will come out of the hospital and the staff will keep back. And this is because the Queen was so desperately ill, regardless of what the press may tell you, the member of staff is right up close and is looking not like a concerned nurse, but like a minder. Let's bear that in mind. Look at the belt buckle. 
The belt buckle, we've got, I've got an enlargement on the left-hand side, which is the Masonic symbol and the magic star. Can anybody here tell me of a, of a good medical uh, practice that has those em emblems? It doesn't exist. So what on earth is going on here? That's a good question, isn't it? We haven't got time to chat that on that one now. But... This is the Pope. One Pope. This is wonderful. Now, I'm not actually interested in this creature here. I'm interested in why the teeth grow at an angle. If you look at the teeth, look at the jawline, the teeth are coming down. They're not following up as they should go. The teeth are coming down. Look at the eyes. This is a, this is a person that's changing, ladies and gentlemen. Changing. One of the reasons he had to go very quickly. Why is President Obama giving the sign of the devil? And why is the, the Pope, the anti-devil, the anti -devil, giving also the sign of the devil? What is the link between those two? What might that be, I wonder? Let's send them into a crazy dance. <laughs> Why is your next king giving you the sign of the devil? And for those of you who don't know, and, and why should you know, when you, I won't do it because I've been taught this is the wrong thing to do. If you point, you are hexing somebody. Now this may be a joke. He may, I, I don't know who the camera person is, and if I did know, I wouldn't say. Um, it's come from Reuters. It was leaked to Reuters. So it may be just a joke, but you don't joke in the satanic field. So that is a hex. Why is he, the king, the future king, your future king, giving you a devil sign like the Pope and like Obama? Let's get rid of him. Okay, let's talk about me. Um, as a small boy, um, my family used cinema and TV for instructional purposes. Not for me, the likes of Bambi, Jungle Book and Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Um, the, the, the kids I went to school with, their parents felt so sorry for me because I wasn't being taken to these sort of films, that when they took their children, I was taken along as well. Uh, the f Danny Kubrick, when I talk about the very first film I went to see actually was The Alamo, and I was three and a half years old, and my mother said to me, um, you're going to be taken to see this film to see if you can sit quiet. So I sat quiet through The Alamo, and, and I very quickly went on to see Stanley Kubrick's film, uh, Doctor Strangelove. Uh, I was about four, or four years old. Um, a wonderful film. Uh, uh, thanks to Win Keach. Win Keach is a, a, a fantastic researcher, and uh, I had the wrong dates. Uh, I, I'd remembered wrongly from my mother. My mother said that Stanley Kubrick worked for the uh, NSA, um, NASA in 1968-1969, but uh, Win Keach reminded me that uh, Stanley Kubrick worked from them from 1965. So thanks to Win for the update. Um, very briefly, what happened? It's very, it's very important for you. Um, Kubrick wanted to make this film of an American bomber. He wrote to Strategic Air Command, SAC, and said, can I film in a bomber? And they said, not on your life. And because you've asked, we want to see the film before you produce it. So he made the film, sent it to them. They were so impressed with this film, particularly the back projection, that in 1964 they said, we want you for our false moon landing. 1961, Kennedy had said, we're going to get on the moon. And 1968, um, Kubrick had had so much money from the Americans that he had an agreement to make any film he wanted and no one was going to tell him what to do until eyes wide shut, for those of you who, who know. So here's a, a clip from uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey. There's, there's nothing controversial about this at all. You've got a mound of grain, a uh, land with some real animals on it and some uh, actors dressed as monkeys and the white line shows you the backdrop. What Kubrick designed was a curtain of glass beads millions and millions of glass beads strung on thin threads and seven or eight cameras all projecting. Now we know this is the case because he said so uh, and also no camera can give you something in, in the far distance that's sharp in focus as well as something nearby. So he designed this. Here's another one. There's an actor sitting on a piece of grass and the white line, everything to the left is a back projection. So why is this important? Because there's an official picture of the moon landings and there we have a line. Stanley Kubrick worked for, the, uh, for NASA uh, officially from 1968 to 1969. Unofficially, he worked there from 1965 onwards. Okay. Okay, the, the top bit's missing there because the screen isn't right. But um, my mother, who died in 1979, told me in March 79 that there was going to be a really up-and-coming actor 
who would star in a sword and sorcery film. He was an unknown actor, and he would then go on to be president of the United States. And she told me this two and a half years before this film came out. This man, Arnold Schwarzenegger. And she also said he would go on and be a robot. This is 1979, two years before the film was made. My mother was telling me who would be the next president. Let's have a look at this. This is taken, this is the original Bush. And before um, <clears throat> Schwarzenegger was really a big star. Those of you who know the conspiracy, it's not conspiracy, it's real. This is the Terminator 2, for those of you who are not used to it. And in the section... Um, John Connor, the little boy, is on the motorbike. Arnold Schwarzenegger comes along, lifts up the boy, sticks it on the back of his bike, and the liquid metal robot smashes into the top. And as you can see, it says caution 911. Well, of course, that means 9 foot 11 inches, doesn't it? It doesn't really mean 911, does it? Um, he played the robot, all right. And from another film, um, look at the side. One. TV company number 9 company, and the other company number 11 company, and this is The Simpsons. Sure, that's $9.11 to go to New York, isn't it? No, it isn't. It's 9.11. The Illuminati have to tell you what they intend to do, but in such an obscure way that unless you understand the way of the workings, you will never know what the plans are. So the public were being alerted in, in Terminator 2's case some 10 years prior to it happening. Ten years. These things are planned and organised and worked out. 9-11. Okay, um, back to me. Um, there's nothing unusual about a young boy, or a young girl for that matter, watching Joan Iron Stingray, and you can read those lists. What is unusual is the manner I was watching them. I was told I had to watch them. And the routine was that I would be sitting in a chair, I was not allowed to eat or drink, and I had to watch them, I wasn't allowed to speak. At the end of each programme, I was allowed to ask some questions of my mother. One of my mother's favourite ones was Stingray. Reptiles living under the sea. I'll just go, go back to Marina. I actually said to my mother, because I've been obviously a young boy, is that a mermaid? And my mother said, no, that's, that's a creature that's half reptile and half human. Right? And that's back in 1965. Uh, Doctor Who, I was only allowed to watch certain episodes of Doctor Who. Uh, one of the episodes I was allowed to watch was the Doctor Who and the Silurians, which was in 1970, and is again reptiles who live under the earth. Mother insisted I watch that. Mother also insisted that in June 1971, I watched another Doctor Who, which was called Doctor Who and the Daemons. And there's Roger Delgado, who played the master, giving you the devil's sign. This guy, Patrick McGowan on the left, I was told basically would be my role model. This is the guy I had to model myself after. The guy on the right, an American man in a suitcase, my grandfather really liked him, but I was told he was too rough, too aggressive, and in Britain we don't behave like that. For those of you who don't know, um, the guy on the left, Patrick McGowan, played a secret agent, and the guy on the right played an ex-member of the CIA. And these were the programs that I had to watch. I wasn't allowed to have friends around. I had to sit quietly and watch this. Very well acted, and if you ever get a chance to watch it on YouTube, please do so. Um, and my mother said, if you grow up like him, I will be very pleased. So that was my role model. And he played a guy um, in a, a fictitious security service called MI9, or M9. Prisoner, you must have seen the prisoner. What you may not know is the guy sitting there is George Markstein, who worked for MI5 in the 1950s and 1960s and was a personal friend of, John, of uh, McGoon and helped him to create the prisoner. So that's George Markstein. He doesn't appear in the credits until the very end. But that's him sitting at the desk. He actually has a, has a role to play. Okay. The guy I mentioned to you, Paul Dunlop, said to me when this program came on, which is the prisoner, you will ensure that he will be watching. It was late. It was on 9 o'clock in the evening. And I would have been, what, 10 years old? Uh, no, I'd have, been even, I'd have been seven or eight years old. And I went to bed before nine o'clock, but I was allowed to stay up and watch this. In fact, I had to watch it. And this is a guy, 
playing one of the episodes and we're told that's an undertaker. To me that's a man in black because undertakers don't wear sunglasses. Okay? So okay, we've, we've got the, the male role model, now we have to find the female role model for me. Does anybody recognise that? Avengers. Great, well done. This is the picture of Diana Rigg that everybody knows, a dominatrix. Very, very, um, you know, was actually very powerful in women's lib during the 1960s. Um, and I'm sure she was. But she played one particular role which I was made to watch regularly. Okay, um, you need to understand again, please, that um, with the Illuminati, you have world play. And if you go on Google and you look up Diana Rigg, you'll find that they said, we wanted to create a woman who had man appeal. That's what they wanted, a, uh, a character had man appeal. Okay, well, I don't, I don't buy that from what I've been told. Uh, it had to have masochism appeal. So the M comes from masochism. Emma Peel was her name. So for those of you who, who don't know, Sado masochism is an absolute vital part of satanic ritual. It's a vital part of the masters. So even if you're not a satanist and you are a master in the Illuminati, you'll be, in fact it's actually called BDSM, you'll be absolutely into it. It's what you do. So they had to decide whether she was going to be Miss or Mrs. M. Appeal. And they decided she would be Mrs. M. Appeal because they needed the S to bring in the S and the M. So they've got the S, E, M. So that looks like an N. So S and M. So I'd say BDSM is an integral part of Illuminati masters, whether they practice Satanism or not. Okay, I need to back that up. Big statement. She played in one episode called The Queen of Sin. And uh, you can actually see this on, on YouTube. Uh, it was banned in America for 15 years. The Americans immediately saw what was going on and refused to screen it. The British, at that time, the censors were very upper-class people. They were looking for nudity, swear words, anti-religious uh, diatribe, but that was it. They didn't actually understand what was going on. And there was one whipping scene, which is exactly what I would expect in a BD BDSM session, and they just cut the part of the whipping scene. And this is the character she played. Now this, you might be interested to know that she designed her own costume. She's a head of punk by nearly 10 years. She has a collar around her neck. And she carries a snake, which is the serpent of the reptilians. And is the mark of the Satanism. The actual episode was called A Touch of Brimstone. And here's a shot from The Touch of Brimstone. Very satanic looking. A dominatrix or slave, she has a collar around her neck. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, the slave always wears a collar in sex sessions. And he's got a lead. And here she's locking about with one of the directors and she's put the lead on him. So we're not talking about just a collar. We are talking exactly of a BDSM with a collar and a lead. Diana Rigg went to a very interesting school. She went to the school of Moravia with a Templar cross. Very interesting school. There's Tony Blair. Hello, Tony. Six, six, six. Look at Tony Blair's hand. Six, six, six. Let's look at some more. 1969, to my knowledge, the very first time that the symbol 666 and the devil sign was used at the same time, captured for the very first time in the photograph, a yellow submarine, launching the, the album and the film, the cartoon, 1969. We've got the devil sign. You might be interested. I'm sure you will be. I hope you will be. Otherwise, what the hell am I doing here? Um, when I was 14 or 15 years of age, I was introduced to John Lennon's father. John Lennon's father is Freddie Lennon. Freddie married a woman 20 years younger than him. And I was told that um, they had a young child. Uh, and it was my job to babysit this child while they went out. Now, now that sounds incredible because Freddie Lennon could have picked the phone up to anybody and said, I'm... John Lennon's dad, and I want you to send the best babysitter you've got in the world, and they would have done so. Uh, I was taken round and I had a meal with John Lennon's father and the woman he was, he was married to, and I was introduced to the boy. And I can tell you this child was about five years old and played me a recital on the piano at five years old. And I, I probably babysit for about seven or eight times, and I was told by John Lennon's father, we would not have anybody else babysit our child because you are part of the order. That's what I was told. 
I have a tremendous respect for David Icke. He takes a hell of a lot of crap in the news, but I have a lot of respect for him. And this is somebody who he fell out with, and I would just like to point your attention to the hand sign that she's giving the camera. On the left, possibly Madonna. Um, you can see that there's a guy with a T-shirt with a uh, um, pyramid and an eye of Horus, and she's giving the 666 sign. And let's go back to the right, because there is none other than Diana Rigg in that show that I've said doing the 666 sign. Um, Pamela, the uh, ex-partner of um, David Icke, has a website, and there's a lovely picture there of a feather. Don't you think that's a lovely picture of a feather? Yeah. And oh dear me, no, the man that I'm supposed to follow, the man I'm supposed to um, really be my role model, look very carefully. Now, if you think that's just an accident, in Illuminati signs, you always point the way. And he has his finger, and he's pointing the way. Okay? So we have the devil sign very, very surreptitiously hidden, but the other guy who's um, producer is actually pointing it out just in case you miss it. Uh, I haven't been able to bring my pictures today. It's a shame. So if I ever get invited to, to another one of these talks, I'll, um, I'll bring them. Uh, one visit to a grandfather, I was taken from Worthing Station um, on the train to London. We were met by a chauffeur at uh, Victoria Station taken to a building, I don't know, I was very young, it was a 20 minute drive, and I met Patrick McGowan. And Patrick McGowan was actually in role for me. So he was playing the MI9 agent. He wasn't, you know, um, John, he wasn't Patrick McGowan, he was playing John Drake. And he presented me with a signed picture of himself and he asked me what was my favorite episode and we talked about a favorite episode. Um, and that was great. Six months later, I was introduced to Diana Rigg and she gave me a signed picture as well. She asked me what the picture was. The only difference is that Diana Rigg did not play in that in role. She was just herself. And she found it incredibly embarrassing because the picture I've got, I haven't put it here, I've got the picture of that that she signed for me. And that was all worked out by my grandfather for me. How much time have we got? Can someone just give me a shout? 20 minutes, mate. 20 minutes, okay. Right, I'll have to do some alien experiences. So I'll just quickly do the reptile ones because the reptile ones are the ones that Channel 4 didn't put in. They wouldn't, wouldn't put Channel, Channel 4 wouldn't have any reptile experiences in. So here we go. Um, we'll try five minutes for talk, for questions. Okay, I'll just go through it sharpish. On the left-hand side, that's me at school. And on the right-hand side, that's me at school. However, there's about one year difference between them and it's a very different child. Um, on the left hand side is the happy smiling boy and on the right hand side is someone who's somewhat not so happy and not so smiley. In fact, I wanted my whole personality changed and that's why I had my hair done the other way. Something happened in between those two photos. Um, I've had contact all my life, but this is a particularly scary contact and we're gonna quickly go through it. Um, people talk about reptilians. Uh, the reptilians that I'm most familiar with were called the Draconis reptilians. So I'm gonna talk about Draconis, the White King. That's the drawing that I did um, of the being that I refer to as Dad. The reason I call him Dad is because he told me that is what you must address me as. Now I worked with, and I worked with a, a very, very gifted uh, artist in America who asked me if he could render my drawing professionally and then we would both have copyright for it. The guy's name was David Chase. It took three months to do. He would draw a part, send it to me, and I would say, um, no, it's not quite like that. That's David Chase. No, you've got the talons wrong. Send that back. No, your arms are not thick. He didn't ever get cross. He never got frustrated. He's an incredible guy. And although the contrast is not good on this camera, this is what he's rendered for me. David Chase for Simon Parks. We both have copyright on it. Um, the things at the back are spines, which are vestigial wings. They can move them, but they can't fly with them. So they move them in, in, in ritual and ceremony. There's a white body, red eyes, very scaly. This doesn't detract at all from people saying they see reptilians are green. Well, to be perfectly honest with greeny brown, that's because the greeny brown ones, in my estimation, are the soldiers, the warriors. The white skin beings are the ones that are the royal line. Mission patches, you're all familiar with mission patches. I hope you are. Um, not very good in this country. We're not into them. Boy Scouts, Girl Guides, we have 
patches for this, that and the other. And that's about it on their uniform. The Americans are absolutely mad keen on them. Here's one from the Apollo. Very official. Anybody who worked on the Apollo program has those sewn into them. And I've just brought a section. I've got some with me. If you, during the break, you want to come and have a look at them, I can show you. Uh, my question is, first of all, um, not, well, I suppose, not because we've got a laser beam firing in space, because it says here, airborne laser, flight test, peace through light. I should think half the population would be absolutely devastated to learn there are laser beams in space. But that's not why I'm showing it to you. Why is a snake firing the laser beam? Why, of all the creatures that could go on an official patch, that worn by men and women who serve in the armed forces, would there be a snake? Here's another one. This is a patch, the official emblem of the National Reconnaissance Office, which is the uh, part of the American arm that does all the uh, spy satellites. Why is there a dragon holding the earth? Why, in this one, are there three snakes encircling the earth? And in Latin, very loosely translated, that says, never before, never again. And I would contend that means you humans have never been free in the past and you will never be free in the future. Here's another one. Here is the earth with a huge dragon and a snake around it. And um, in Latin, it basically translates as all your underground bases are subservient to us. Why would you say that on an official patch? All your underground bases are subservient to us. Little test, please, UFO researchers, don't help out. What's this represent, do you think? It's, it, it's similar to the Pleiades. It's very similar. It's, it's not in this instance, but you're right, it's very similar. What? Shall? No, it's not. No, Dave Hodrin got married there. Right, five stars. One, two, three, four, and then the one extra. Area five one. Area fifty one. It's all coded. All of this stuff is coded. Here's another one, and that's a dragon firing lightning bolts out of the cloud, and it says if you're not initiated, get out. Okay? Who knows what the five oh nine squadron was? 509 was the actual bomber squadron that removed all the wreckage from Roswell. This is an official patch for the 509 squadron. Why is there a grey alien holding a stealth aircraft? The symbol, um, that sort of symbol circle with a line means the finest angle that you can make your metal work to deflect radar waves. Okay? And then those lines are radar waves. But why would you have a grey alien if greys do not exist? And you don't, why are the military allowed to wear that? This is the 411th Flight Test Squadron, and it assesses the future. Why have you got a wizard with red eyes? Um, one of my drawings, I know it's not going to come out so well, the creature I call Dad, white creature, can someone give me a shout when it's five minutes two, so that I've got time for questions, um, carrying a great white sword. I was sent this after my talk in Nottingham last year. Somebody contacted me and said, if you meet me on the A1, I've got a, a, a real patch that's been worn by somebody, and you're very welcome to it. Now, I get things like this all the time, but I just couldn't turn it down. I thought, well, I'll go to the A1, and if it's just a hoax, I'll just go on and call in one of my friends. Sure enough, this person pulled in on, on a, on a lay-by um, and gave me this patch. And he said, I saw your, uh, it's put onto YouTube, I saw your presentation, uh, and that's your dad, isn't it? because it's the white snake with the red eyes and the big sword. And this guy did have an American accent. And I brought this for you at lunch, uh, break time. If you want to have a look at it, you can. What you need to understand is that they have their day job, the American uh, men and women who do all these special projects. And then when they've done their day job and they go on the special operations, they're on Velcro. And they pull off the day job patch and they put their special patch on. Do their operations, take them off. Um, uh, in my role, role as a counsellor, when, when we often have delegations from America and Canada, these people cannot understand how we treat our flag. The American and the Canadian flag comes all beautifully wrapped up. And, you know, in this country, we just treat it as, as if it doesn't matter. So in the same way, the Americans have a massive pride for their patches. Now, if you look at the Earth, it's got a grid around it. That's an energetic grid. People talk about harp. 
Um, it's my opinion, I don't want to upset any of you, but my view is that HARP is not necessarily designed to control the weather. It's to control the energetic level around the Earth, because unless you guys can get out of this 3D world and move towards a 4D world, in other words, unless you can evolve spiritually, uh, you're going to be trapped here. And there are a number of people who do not want you to evolve. So uh, I contend that this grid is an energetic grid held around the Earth to prevent you from beginning to ask too many questions. Um, this is a, a drawing I did of one of the creatures who wears a double sash, Draconis reptilian. Please look at the, the mouth. Uh, 1965, I was a page boy, and I never smiled for any pictures because I thought I was back in the ceremony. If you have taken part in a reptilian ceremony, it is all about the culture, the ceremony, and the ritual. To attend a wedding as a five-year-old boy, um, just smack to the total ritual. So although I was being asked to smile, I refused to smile because I've been taught you don't smile during the ritual. And here, I manage a half a smile because the brides, bridesmaids on the left had asked me to smile and I outranked them. Again, it's all ritual. I held the, the, the bride's dress. The bridesmaids were behind me. Therefore, I must be more important than the bridesmaids. I don't do what they tell me. But um, I'm not as important as the bride because she's ahead of me. So when she said to me, can you smile? I was in conflict. So I managed to half a smile. Uh, the reward for doing all this was to go to Butlin's holiday camp and I give a very reptilian grin when my mother asked me to grin. Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger could do a grin like that too. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're running out of time. I really need you to question, to resist, and to move from this money-dominated matrix into a much higher form so here we've got the National Reconnaissance Office on the left-hand side, their official badge with the NSA showing a grid around the Earth. And there's the one that I've shown you with a grid around the Earth. This is an energetic grid, um, because if you can start to evolve and ask questions, you are unstoppable. You really are unstoppable. But there's not enough of you asking questions. You really need to make sure that you share the word. And this, I just had to put this in. This was the latest find from, from the 9-11 um, towers being destroyed. Another piece of aircraft wreckage found so many years afterwards. Absolutely ludicrous. That's one metre wide and this part of the tail flap is supposed to have been found all the time afterwards. I don't buy and you've got Andrew Johnson going to give you a really, really good talk about 9-11 um, and it's well worth listening to. So I'm going to stop there and just take any questions. Is that okay? Thank you. Right, the, the question being asked there was about the Hadron Collider. Um, why do I think the device failed and how would the energy levels have been affected? The device failed because it was taken out. It was taken out. The object of the device was to create some form of backfeed to prevent a... When 2012 occurred, don't just think of it as on the one day. Everybody got fixated with this one day. That's not the case. Three days before and three days afterwards, the energetic levels were peaking. And crucial point happened when it reached the, ter the top point. But all of those two to three days either side were vital. And this machine was designed to operate over that exact period of time to send out a, a false signal to try and block that. And that's why it was very important. And I've shown you the slide. That machine was taken out. We cannot afford to do that. The, the, the Aztec guy, Akhtar, uh, was the backstop. Had that device not been taken out, he was going around South America, um, he'd raised money from all the local peoples, and he was placing these devices uh, where pyramids had been, where he felt were very holy places, to attempt to um, ameliorate the device had it worked. It wasn't needed because the device was taken out. We're going to have this again in about two years' time because this device is going to be made larger. And I, I expect to see the same thing happening. Thank you.
Um, very many people who go into film, music, go in at a very young age. Um, they're extremely gifted people, tremendous artists with a very high ideal. There are people around them who wish to corrupt them and control them and change them. And often with these people, they turn their back on it, to use your terminology. They go with it for a while because it's great, sex, drugs, the usual story. And then they come to a point where they think, what the hell am I doing here? This isn't right. And they look at the harm and the damage done around them. And then they search inside themselves and they find them true selves. And they let themselves go forward. And what happens is the minders around them decide that that's enough, the time is finished. So, yes, he was taken out because he was a danger. Um, I'll wear any of your Project Bluebeam. Um, project Bluebeam comes from a project which initially was going to be run uh, against Cuba. The idea was that um, Cuba had always been a non-Rothschild controlled uh, place. And if the Virgin Mary could be projected above Rothschild, I beg your pardon, uh, above Cuba, uh, because it's a very staunch Catholic country. Uh, the idea being that the message could be put out to rise up against Fidel Castro and overturn. Now, in the 1960s, such um, technology existed. The technology was going to be fired from a destroyer, from a boat, and projected up. Now the technology is capable from satellites in space. I don't want to go down that road too much because when you have your lecture from about 9-11, I'm sure there'll be elements that link with that. So Project Bluebeam has advanced now to an incredibly wonderful, I mean wonderful in the sense of technology, holographic image that has sound projected with it. And you actually think the sound is coming from the image that you see. You, were you being groomed to be uh, in the higher echelons of the Illuminati? Is that the, the role that you had set out for you? I'm still asking myself that question. Um, I didn't go down that road. Um, I've had experiences with what you would call shadow beings. Um, shadow beings are incredible, energetic creatures, very evil, the ones I met, very evil. Although nothing has ever hurt me, um, these creatures are, have the ability to work with young children because they work energetically. Um, and certainly from about 1965 onwards, mm -hmm. I've had that link. Um, I still to this day, don't know the full link, but my family were what we would call Illuminati, though I don't think they would be satanic Illuminati. Uh, why I didn't go down that road, I just don't know. Did you join the Labour Party? Um, I always say that the Labour Party is, is the lesser of all evils. Okay. I'm going to take the lady at the back there. Um, I'm very interested in um, Stan Lee. I don't know if you know who Stan Lee is. Stan Lee is the American gentleman who created Marvel Comics. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I, I've laid out there the path that I was put down. Maybe if I'd been in America or something like that, I would have gone down that route. Um, I absolutely know that security services pass ideas to filmmakers. They will actually say, here's an idea, run with it. We actually want this out. So run with it. Um, a number of people are either in the film industry who have contact. Robbie Williams, I've talked. Look at the videos that go with his songs. Uh, he actually has a big hand in those videos. Uh, unlike Lady Gaga, who takes all her instruction from other people. Um, I wouldn't at all be surprised. Next question. Uh, that lady there. <coughs> They don't want to be on the wrong side of the fence when the end comes. There are a number of people who um, 
are changing and can see that they just can't go anywhere, that it's over. The Illuminati are actually up against the wall. Um, they're destroying this country and the world economically. They're destroying it uh, in every way they can. Um, and the object of the few is to have a wonderful life somewhere. But all the, all the groups just under the top echelons are looking at it and thinking, well, we're going to be pushed out of the boat. So perhaps it, now it's time to not just jump ship, but to join the other side. Um, in my case, I've never subscribed to the satanic view. Um, I've never been a member of the Illuminati. The, this attempt to try and get me on board, because they have given up, they know that I won't in any way, they can't be threatened. And so this is an attempt they made to get me to join, um, and I've refused that. So yes, things are changing. There was a person at the back, put the hand up, lady there. Well, whatever it is, it's disgusting and uh, it's just uh, absolutely repulsive. Um, no, no, you've asked your question. No, you've asked your question. No, I'm gonna... sorry, no, no, I no. No. no, I'm speaking. My, my great grandmother was married at the, at the age of 12. We would consider her child bride, yet it was common practice. And so, moral moves of society change, but it does not make it intrinsically evil. Right, thank you. Um, there's a difference between um, somebody having, having a child and someone being re repeatedly brutalised. Um, I don't agree with you that humanity shares a very long link with monkeys, basically. Absolutely not. No, it's, not, no, look, it's my turn to speak. Okay, let's be fair. I don't accept that. I think that, that humans, my own view, humans came to this planet a very long time ago and you were far better and stronger than you are now. A reptilian influence came to this planet and tricked you and dumbed you down. And since that time, you have been struggling to find who you are. And only in these last few years are you beginning to wake up to who you are and question. Um, I, I, I'm not even going to answer any more of those questions from that lady. Um, we've got actually, actually guys, we're going to have to call it that. Okay. If you don't mind, thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you so much.